Vamos a dar comienzo a la, a la segunda jornada de este coloquio con la intervención de don Carlos Evaristo, persona conocida por todos nosotros, experto en temas de nobiliaria. Y sin más, eh, le, doy, le doy la palabra. Carlos, al ataque. Muchísimas gracias. Se está funcionando, sí. Buenos días a todos. Good morning, everyone. Buongiorno a tutti. Um, so as not to spend any time on, on other things, let's get right to the subject. I was given the, the subject of the survival of feudal rights and recognition of autonomous neutral territories during monarchies and in present day republics. Very, very interesting theme. A challenge for me. Anyway, I found out that, um, in fact, many medieval feudal rights and privileges are still afforded some of the royal and noble houses of Europe, and few people are aware that in this modern day and age, many medieval feudal rights and privileges are still, uh, you know, flaunted by many royal houses and, and uh, noble houses, and most of these remain symbolic and are not exercised for the scandal that they might provoke. Uh, rights of royals such as those styled kings of Jerusalem, uh, who have privileges uh, that most European monarchs had, who were descendants of the sovereigns of the Latin kingdom of Jerusalem. And uh, these included such things as riding a horse through the church and, and into the basilicas and things like this that you could still do today, I'm sure. But of course, you'd have CNN and everybody else there, <laughs> and the police probably. But anyway, uh, these um, monarchs, uh, I'd say only the monarchs of England and Spain still use the title uh, Kings of Jerusalem. And although the British sovereigns are still crowned and anointed under the canopy and uh, seated upon the coronation chair of St. Edward, which is actually a reliquary throne, um, I don't think there's anybody else that really does this today with uh, a piece of the wall of Jerusalem uh, underneath the, the actual uh, uh, throne so that you can be a, a king of Jerusalem in, in fact. Uh, it's, of course, called Jacob's uh, um, sleeping pillow, which would have been a very hard pillow, but anyway. I guess. <laughs> um, the right to use these ancient titles uh, is par uh, with that to use ancient symbolic coats of arms, referring to no longer existent kingdoms and empires. It's also exercised by many nobles, as is the privilege for royals to sit in the presence of the pope or for uh, queens to wear white instead of black during papal audiences at the Vatican. Likewise, certain royal houses, such as the Portuguese, still have the title uh, Fidelissima, most faithful, or Serenissima, most serene house of Braganza. These were titles that were granted. Hola, Manuel. <laughs> Um, most um, these titles were granted by popes in the Middle Ages, and it's unthinkable uh, that anybody would really use these privileges today. Uh, privileges that certain royals and even high-ranking nobles descending from royals had um, that still, I guess, would be uh, kosher today would be to grant titles of nobility, and uh, they're still claimed by many pretenders who choose either to exercise or not. That's the case of the Portuguese Ducal House of Braganza and other parent noble houses. They had, in the 15th century, the power to um, actually raise an army of 60,000 men. Uh, they had gentlemen in waiting who were German. Uh, they were like Swiss guards, and they dressed like the Swiss guards from the Vatican. Um, they um, also granted titles up to that of Marquis. And this before they became the ruling house of Portugal in 1640, which is really interesting. Uh, knights and hereditary knights of the Portuguese royal house were also created independent of the Portuguese state, monastic, and dynastic orders. Uh, and this by the Dukes of Braganza, by the queen consorts, by the princes and princesses. The most famous case is uh, Saint Nuno Alvarez Pereira, the, um, the uh, founder of the royal house of Portugal. And uh, he was made a page in the court by Queen, the infamous Queen uh, Leonor, 
uh, and he did not belong to any order, which is really interesting. He commanded all of the orders of Portugal as the great, the great constable, and he was knighted by the, by the queen. Um, we have the cases of uh, the widowed queen Amelia d'Orleans y Braganza, who um, in exile uh, also um, exercised the power of the sovereign uh, and granted orders like Our Lady of Conception of Villa Viçosa, which she gave to Antonio Oliveira Salazar when she visited uh, in, the 19, in 1945. And uh, in fact, um, she had never been the grand mistress of the order to be able to give the, these orders, but she did nonetheless, and nobody disputed it. Um, the case of other royal houses, for example, Italian, the Italian royal house of Savoy, I found that there is a privilege uh, in the 17th century where um, delegates of the order who were royal princes of royal blood could actually invest knights uh, independent of, of the, the sovereign, which was interesting. Um, most people have heard that during the jubilee now of um, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II of the many rights and privileges she, she still supposedly holds as sovereign of the United Kingdom and in her other many realms, uh, things like uh, uh, you know, she can, uh, all the swans belong to her and the bears from, from, <laughs> from Canada and things like that. Uh, I, I believe that, you know, that many of these things are symbolic and in fact only the, uh, the, um, the giving, the granting of arms and things like that through the heraldic offices are, are really the privileges that the queen really, really bestows today. I don't see her creating any new titles uh, very frequently or, uh, although, you know, she has for her children and grandchildren and things like that. But um, also, uh, you know, Canada, of course, impedes the use of, uh, of these titles of knighthood and things uh, due to the Nickel Resolution of 1919. So, um, you know, the title of Sir that was granted to the premiers and, and, and that was abolished. Um, however, they've carried out on occasion uh, grants of these titles uh, to Canadians uh, who have dual citizenship or have acquired dual <laughs> citizenship and so were able to uh, go through that. Um, the feudal rights uh, legally have been restyled as corporate estate rental agreements. So many of these we find in Portugal and in Brazil that the feudal rights and privileges of taxation still survive today, but they are in favor of these non-reigning uh, royals or noble houses. Uh, and in fact, believe it or not, uh, they are afforded ancient um, you know, feudal taxes that have been restyled uh, in somewhat controversial corporate estate rental agreements and, and even neutral territories that have been recognized. Uh, Infatilses, laudemius and foros, which are tenors, um, tenures are uh, you know, today um, in a legal institution, uh, although they all originated in Roman law and uh, during the Dark Ages, they developed into the feudal taxation rights. Uh, we know that these things go back as far as ancient Greece in the 5th century BC, uh, then they were adapted by the Roman Empire. You know, I can develop all this afterwards in, in the uh, publication that I'm sure will be published later so I don't have to bore you with all, the, with all the technical facts, but I just want to share with you some of the interesting things. But basically there were uh, uh, two um, infatilzas, as we call them in Portuguese, the, the use which was a long term and was a temporary uh, sort of lease of the land. And then there was another one that was perpetual. And uh, separately and quite distinctly from uh, the, um, these other different systems that had evolved in the third century AD where Roman emperors began to grant private individuals upon payment of an annual fee, which was called a canon, uh, uncultivated lands belonging to the imperial family. And then you got the problem that what is, what is state-owned? What is imperial? And so he had all this confusion. Uh, was he abusing his power? So, uh, you know, nothing is really very um, different today. <laughs> These things have always been uh, in existence. And uh, the latifundia, which is uh, known as the latifundiarios, the, 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 the big uh, plantation owners and, and landowners, uh, you know, they usually expanded these lands by granting these uh, tenures. From the fourth century, the two institutes, uh, they uh, became more common in the Justinian era, 
And um, in Portugal, the institute became a feudal and taxation land right of royals and nobles over private lands that passed from the Justinian law to titles 78, 79, and 80 of the fourth book of the Afonsinian ordinances. And from these to the titles 63, 64, 65 of the fourth book of the Manueline ordinances. And finally from there, uh, the titles 36 and 40 of the fourth book of the Philippine ordinances under the Spanish Habsburg kings of Portugal. In Brazil during the, uh, or until January 10th, 2003, which was the end of the validity of civil code of 1916, the infatilses were uh, considered a right. However, with the beginning of the validity of uh, the January 11, 2003 act, um, this left the list of rights which are provided for in an article called 1225 of the new civil code. So the medieval taxation rights to receive um, taxations laudemu from lands corresponds now to 2.5% of the sale price of former taxable lands that were feudal being now owned uh, by the, uh, the representative of the former uh, feudal uh, right, uh, and they receive every time there is a transfer of property 2.5%. Another thing they, they, they can have is the right to the option to buy. So they can buy back the land for themselves and then hold it incompletely uh, and not for the price that's on record. So uh, if they want it, they can have it for the lower price that's on record. Otherwise, they always get the 2.5% in perpetuity anytime there's a transfer of land or taxation, which is really great. Um, we also uh, have the situation in, um, in Brazil where uh, terms were granted uh, upon vacant stocks at the time of the assets of the royal house to the uh, house of the queen, the household of the queen, the household of the infantes, who were the princes. And these became known as the morgados or morgadios. And these uh, were also assets. There were also assets uh, that were given to military orders because Portugal was divided into military orders and states. Uh, and each one received the uh, feudal taxation of uh, different uh, areas that they were given. Uh, these morgadios uh, became, in the 16th century, uh, created for the Prince of Beta, who was the crown prince. So the assets of the former duchy of Braganza and Beja uh, were the greatest, and they formed the state. They were actually a state within a state. And we can say that the duchy of Beja, which was very great, it actually ran the Order of Christ, which was known as an enterprise. It was a, for, it was a, a private enterprise, and uh, they invested in this for the discoveries, and uh, until John II confiscated all of these assets because of the treason of the Dukes of Braganza and the Dukes of Beja. The Duke of Braganza was executed. The Duke of Beja, he personally stabbed in the back because he was a his brother-in-law who lived in the palace and he loved, so he killed him in a loving embrace. Uh, and uh, then he took all of the assets of the Order of Christ and gave it to his wife, who was the surviving sister. And uh, the wife applied them to an order that she created called the Order of Mercy, and which is run by the Trinitarians. And it is today the wealthiest, most powerful organization in Portugal, uh, Santa Casa de Misericordia, the Holy House of Mercy. It owns churches, it owns hospitals, it owns the National Lottery, uh, and uh, it, it in fact is the remaining assets of this feudal rights that the Order of Christ had, that the House of Beja had. It's per perpetuated in this great uh, enterprise. Um, I can also uh, say that the House of Braganza um, foundation created in 1933 through the last will and testament of King Dom Manuel II was the first foundation in Portugal. And it incorporated the feudal rights of the Dukes of Braganza. 
uh, the former duchy of Braganza, and uh, all of those assets, and those are the uh, connected to the minor titles of uh, Count of Orain and Marquis of Villa Vissosa, all these titles that Duke of Braganza holds, they had the corresponding lands and the taxation, feudal taxation of these lands. So you have Villa Vissosa, Orain, Portel, Alter du Chão, and Alvitu with its private castles and its um, uh, palaces and historic and artistic collections, which are today museums, which bring in a lot of revenue. And Salazar government, um, the Republican government, in fact, during 1917, 31, and 32, they had sessions and, and, and th th they uh, resolved that, in fact, these belongings were family belongings. They belonged, these assets belonged to the House of Braganza before they, they came to the throne, and so they were private, and so they could keep them. And so the House of Braganza Foundation was created because Salazar, the dictator of Portugal, and Queen Amelia, the last queen uh, mother, decided that it was best that these be kept in escrow should the monarchy return so that the, the, they could support the royal family. And so that's the only reason why the, the Duke of Braganza did not get the rights over these possessions. However, the, the Salazar did convince the Queen Amelia and the widowed Queen Augusta Vitoria to leave their personal assets and create another foundation called the Manuel II Foundation, which was created in 1963. And many people uh, were perplexed to see this magazine, which is like a time-like magazine in Portugal. It said, the millions that Don Duarte and the House of Braganza have. And it details all of these things I'm talking to you about, uh, where they've put all of the assets that are millions of, of, of euros, millions and millions of euros in assets uh, in, um, that belong to these foundations. But of course, they don't, Don Duarte doesn't get any actual money from them, except from the rents of a few apartment building blocks in, in, in Lisbon. So uh, although the royal family does not manage these assets, and neither does it have anything to do with the state-run House of Braganza, there was, however, provision left uh, so that the dowries that were received by the queens, which um, amounted to, in, in Queen Amelia's case, and, and Queen um, Augusta Vitoria, uh, almost a city block in Lisbon. Uh, and these are assets that the Manuel II Foundation still has today. But another thing that isn't known is that Italy gets money from Portugal as well. The King Fernando, way back uh, in the uh, 14th century, actually going further back to the time of King Dennis, when he invited, he, he created the Order of Christ with the ruins of the Templar Order, and invited Italian navigators to come from the Italian states and teach the Portuguese how to navigate so they could go forward and discover new, world, new lands. Um, he let these Italians settle outside the Fernandine Wall, and the Church of the Italians of Loreto in Lisbon is considered the, the, the frontier there. That's where the wall used to run. So the Italian community was outside this wall near this church of Our Lady of Loreto, and they established a little villa there, a little city with their own uh, people from Genoa and other places, uh, Venice and whatnot, and the king gave them perpetual use of these lands. He gave these, this use of these lands, and what happened was that recently an Italian junta was formed by the Vatican, the Embassy of Italy, and the Order of Malta as representative of the former colony. And they went to the state and they got the rights. They have the 2.5% taxation rights on all the properties in the prime real estate area of downtown Lisbon, including all the parking lots. <laughs> and so they get this. Uh, the, the, the Order of Malta recently stopped receiving it because they, their contract with the king was for so many centuries, and it expired recently, <laughs> whereas the Italians is perpetual, represented by the Vatican, represented by the Italian government. And, and, and then we have um, other cases here of autonomous neutral territories and recognitions during monarchies and present-day republics. <laughs> well, we know that, for example, um, in Brazil, there's another uh, interesting situation where the crown gave the 
Marines or the Navy, uh, the perpetual uh, taxation of the lands as a feudal tax, um, as far as the line of the tides. So 500 meters above the highest point of the line of the tides, they have the right of all taxation. That means all the beaches in Brazil pay tax to the Navy in perpetuity. It's a very small tax, however, but they have a lot of beaches. <laughs> so so it, it, it ends up being a, a very good thing. Then you have what's called the princely tax of Petropolis, the laudemio of Petropolis and the lands of the religious order. Today, Brazil has perhaps the greatest surviving feudal taxation rights from lands uh, in history. And the city of Petropolis was actually built on a private estate, a farm, that the first emperor bought for himself, much like Leopold uh, of Belgium bought the Congo for himself. And uh, what happened is he let a city develop there. And then later on, the heirs went and said, OK, well, we own, we own the land. And so all the taxation on the land, a percentage of that has to go in perpetuity to the family. And in fact, it does. And there's been successive laws in Brazil uh, granting this, and um, what's interesting is they've created a corporation. Uh, in 1988, the coup d'etat, uh, you know, respected this uh, laudemio. Uh, it was considered it was not a privilege of the emperor; it was a, of a private citizen, and so it should be upheld. So several locations in Brazil, due to the perpetuity of the infantil's contracts, still pay laudemio to the. Uh, to the royal family, the imperial family, to the navy, and to church orders and other nobles. And it's an incredible amount. Um, it, it is an incredible amount. And uh, 10 of the 53 descendants of Dom Pedro I receive a part of this 2.3 year, yearly taxation rights uh, from the cities and these properties. And the Duke of Braganza, including himself and the Duke of Viseu, his, his brother, receive a part of that, of, of that percentage. Um, at the time of the empire, Gracias. The, um, these uh, farms were, of course, subordinate stewardships of the imperial house. And uh, it's called today the, the uh, Compañía Immobiliaria, the real estate company of Petropolis. Um, autonomous neutral territories, as I had said here, are interesting cases. The Republic of San Marino is perhaps the oldest territory of its kind, founded uh, in 301 AD. It's the oldest surviving sovereign state uh, and constitutional republic in the world, proclaimed by a rebel saint. He decided, you know, I'm not going to pay taxes to the Pope anymore. I'm going to, you know, get this land here. And he did. And, and it, still, it still works. Uh, we have other interesting cases of. Um, the principalities of Andorra and Monaco, for example, uh, how they developed uh, similarly. Liechtenstein, which is interesting, it's only by chance that Liechtenstein exists. Uh, there were two feudal properties that belonged to the Counts of Hohen. Did I pronounce that right? I don't know. <laughs> and uh, they were in fife to the, these counts. Uh, and the emperor decided, because they couldn't pay the yearly taxation rights on the land, we're going to sell them. So the, uh, the lords from Liechtenstein, uh, from these various Habsburg branches, uh, they decided they wanted to set up a free state and principality. And they said, OK, we'll buy this land from you if it's free and we get to keep the, the actual state of the, the whole thing. And they did. And, and you know, it was only recognized, joined the United Nations in 1990. But since 1719, it, uh, you know, they established Liechtenstein as a, as a principality. Um, you know, we have the Isle of Sark, for example, which has an interesting relationship in the, with, with the, as you know, with, the, with Her Majesty the Queen, where she is considered the Duke, of, and they toast the Duke of Sark and not the Queen. Um, you know, there's also the, the other cases of uh, Trieste, for example, which was um, north of Italy and Slovenia which uh, existed in 1947. There's the uh, state and empire, I'm sorry, the Republic of Texas, which existed only for a few years, since 1836 to 1845, had its own dollar, the Texan dollar. Uh, we have the state and empire of Manchukuo, which, uh, of course, is famous for the last uh, emperor uh, of China, which was a thing that you know, lasted for six years and uh, used to be the 
the Manchurian uh, uh, lordships uh, territory where they originally uh, originated from. And it's interesting that only one country recognized its uh, independence as, a, as a, an empire, and it, it was the Vatican. <laughs> it was the only country. Uh, the United Arab Republic, which was something that also existed and no longer exists now. They, they participated in the Olympics and things and, <laughs> and, uh, in 1960. Uh, the Canton Republic of Cartagena in, in Spain, was, uh, they, they, had, they declared their own independence and then they had to be brought down. There's the island kingdom of uh, Ta Tavolola, Tavolara in Italy, where... Um, you know, there's a friend, a friend there who uh, claims to be, he runs a nice restaurant. <laughs> he claims to be the, the king of the island, and he says that at a, heat, at a, at a hunting, during a hunting thing, uh, Carlo Alberto gave him, <laughs> gave him this as a right. But, you know, the, the government uh, did pay antenna rights to have transmitters put on the island and gave money to them. They actually own the island. There's the Koltumishtu, which is a very interesting situation. Uh, which is somewhat uh, unresolved. It's perhaps the most peculiar of all neutral territories. It was an independent microstate between Spain and Portugal, composed of the villages of many villages, and uh, it lasted uh, since the Middle Ages right in, into the, uh, 1868, when it was annexed by Portugal and, and, and Spain. They want, they want to become a republic today. They want, they want autonomy or be a principality or whatever, but it's very interesting. They had three keys. Portugal, Spain, and, and the local region, they each had a key. And that's where all the spies went, and they, they, it was neutral territory. They say Columbus was there as well. Um, then you have Olivenza. Olivenza is a, is a controversial uh, territory that if you go on the map between Portugal and Spain, it does not have the border defined. It, it's, it's, uh, there's, it's undefined because Technically, it's a Portuguese territory, but it was occupied by Spain uh, after the Treaty of Vienna. And uh, they've attempted to be autonomous. Is this a, oh, it's a phone call. <laughs> um, so they, 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 they resurrect this idea of independence, as you can see there, very. And the recent idea of independence for this uh, place was to have the Order of Malta installed there as a principality with a physical state. And this was proposed by the Portuguese Assembly of Knights and the Spanish Assembly of Knights to both governments. <laughs> and uh, it would resolve the situation of Olivenza. It would be the principality of Olivenza, Malta. And the, the, <laughs> the prince, Matthew, Frau Matthew Festing, would be invested there as the prince and sovereign. But of course, Portugal and Spain rejected the, the idea. Uh, I just want to state that it, there are interesting things, for example, there were privileges and rights of feudal taxation and powers that were exercised by the princes of Portugal, who when they became, uh, for example, archbishops of Braga or Évora, they took those powers with them to the office, and then the office inherited these powers so that the Archbishop of Braga was in, him, in his own way uh, a prince in the north of Portugal that ruled pretty much everything from Braga all to, right to the border of Spain. And he was unquestioned because of the fact that there was this privilege that was given by one of them, and there were many famous uh, powerful bishops of Braga who were Portuguese princes like Don, Don Rodrigo de Moratelos, and um, another thing they did was, for example, when the Portuguese became elected um, Grand Masters of the Order of Malta, they decided, well, you know, we should be princes. And so they, the King of Portugal petitioned the Pope to make him a prince, and he did. And he said, well, I have to be elected in a special way. You know, it just can't be by ballot. It has to be by conclave, like the Holy Spirit, you know, like the election of the Pope. So it, were, it was two Portuguese uh, grandmasters that brought these ideas from their own feudal rights and you know, powers that they had. And this became implemented in a tradition that I think maybe very soon is going to, is going to end or become uh, in a different way. But... You know, the special feudal lordships that existed in Portugal also uh, 
were diocesan. For example, the, uh, the uh, bishops of uh, Coimbra had the title of Counts of Arganil. And, and because one of them had been a count, then they all inherited the, the, the titular rights of the count. But for 700 years, the archbishops of Braga ruled over the city uh, as virtual sovereigns. And this ter territory was, was, you know, it went as far as Iria, Iria Flavia, which is today Santiago de Compostela. And if it wasn't for Don Jalmires, Don Diego, Don Diego Jalmires, who was a warrior archbishop and came and took relics from, four times he came and uh, took relics from Braga and, and back to Santiago and changed the name of Iria Flavia to Santiago de Compostela. And if it weren't for him and the Tui, the, the Tui Treaty, uh, you know, the archbishops of Braga would still, you know, uh, uh, they would still extend till there, their territory. But the fact of the matter here with uh, the archbishops of Braga, which is very interesting, is that they are still, uh, is that they still uh, are, in fact, uh, the primate uh, of all of Iberia. They're considered the number one bishops because it was the oldest diocese. Just one, two last little comments. Principality of Pontinha. In 1903, the king of Portugal disannexed this little fort uh, 70 meters off the coast of Funchal in Madeira and sold it. And people bought it as private real estate. This fella, who happened to buy it in the year 2000 for 40,000 euros, Renato Barros, decided that he would pursue the fact that the king had also so sold the sovereignty of that land, of that fortress. And so he created the Principality of Pontinha and fought to actually get it, uh, make it independent. Uh, what happened was uh, interesting is that he, he attempted through the United Nations and other places to do this. And there was a controversial deputy from the Madeira government who insulted the president of Madeira and so incurred in a prison sentence for the crime of aggravated defamation. And he went and sought refuge there, exile. And the Portuguese kind of like, what? <laughs> and so they kind of solved the idea like this, as you can see in the picture. That's <laughs> Prince Renato being <laughs> escorted away. And the other guy went also to jail. So, and uh, they sold the building for uh, tax taxes, back taxes. And so that's the end of the principality. But one principality or kingdom still, in effect, exists, we think, and that is the kingdom of the Algarves. And that's because the Algarve kingdom was always considered separate from the Portuguese kingdom. The kings always styled themselves kings of Portugal and of the Algarve. The Algarves later being the Moroccan territory that they conquered. So it was uh, the Algarves behind and beyond the seas, that was called. Um, and it's interesting that they never proclaimed the Republic of the Algarve. Uh, they never uh, annexed the Algarve. And from the last coin minted by King uh, Dom Manuel, it says he's king of Portugal and the Algarves. So some Americans had the idea a few years ago of having some coins minted and claiming that Don Duarte is, in effect, the king of the Algarve. And so he had these coins minted with the coat of arms. And... Uh, in fact, if the Algarve, um, you know, is uh, an interesting kingdom uh, that it is, uh, is it independent? I think only in the imagination of many people. So, in any case, uh, that's all we have time for. I hope you enjoyed this little presentation. <laughs>